Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome to another Rafael Medina subspecialty virtual morning report. We're very, very excited because we don't have a lot of dermatology subspecialty sessions. And uh, every single dermatologist that I've worked with so far in residency has been extremely excited about medicine and not just dermatology. And uh, the overlap has been extremely interesting. Uh, I'm uh, very excited to uh, introduce Dr. Marissa Barnowski. She's an assistant professor of dermatology at Emory. She practices general and complex derm at Grady Memorial Hospital with a uh, special interest in hydradenitis superativa and med ed. Uh, Marissa, do you want to introduce yourself and tell the medical students and the listeners why they should go into dermatology and how you got there? Absolutely. Yeah, we'll use this as a recruiting into our subspecialty um, time. But hey, everybody. And uh, yes, I'm Marissa. Um, and thanks, Yusef, for the invite. This is really fun and something I've never done before. So excited to kind of learn with the team here. Um, dermatology is great, I think, for its variety. So I love, I was like one of those people who liked a lot of different rotations in med school. And I like that I get to see kids through adults. I get to do procedural and like medical interventions for my patients. I have a lot of kind of tough, heavy, you know, we do skin cancers and HS, which is hydradenitis can be really tough. And, um, you know, so we kind of have that spectrum of disease, but also plenty of like quality of life. Let's make a kid's acne better. And so for me, it's great variety, a lot of fun. Um, and you've never met an unhappy dermatologist. So just a great specialty in general. I've never heard that one before, but I think <laughs> I'm going to start using it. And I think it's definitely true. Yep. Haley, would you want to introduce yourself and tell us similarly, like why you want to derm and why should people go into derm? Hi, everyone. I am Haley Braun. I'm a third year derm resident at Emory University. And I went into dermatology kind of as Marissa said, um, the overlap between like procedural, a procedural specialty um, and like really like kind of complex medicine, especially when you get into like the rheumatologic diseases that have um, dermatologic manifestations, um, getting to manage those like complex diseases with like rituximab or these really like um, kind of very fascinating medications. Um, and then also have the procedural side, I think just always keeps you on your toes um, and also really enjoy having the impact on people's quality of life as, as Marissa said as well. So I, I love it and would highly recommend um, anybody, <laughs> anybody join us. Thank you. And, uh, Haley was in the same class that I was an intern year and uh, she was nerdier than the medicine interns and I remember her vividly working up a patient for renal tubular acidosis and telling me what the urine potassium was but uh, we love to see it. Uh, I don't remember yeah. how to do that anymore. So, sometimes I have to look it up too so don't worry about it. Uh, if you're ready uh, if you can share the screen we can uh, we can start and we can go ahead with the case. All right, so I will start with our chief complaint. Um, we were seeing a young man in his early 20s um, in the CDU or the clinical decision unit for uh, quote unquote bilateral lower extremity cellulitis. Would you like me to jump straight into the, uh, the HPI? Yeah, you can give us just a little bit more information. Okay. Um, yeah, so he had um, come into our institution um, with recurring bilateral um, leg nodules. Um, it had previously been diagnosed as cellulitis, and he had received multiple courses of antibiotics. Um, he reports some improvement with prior antibiotics, but the nodules never fully went away. Um he doesn't have any pertinent infectious history, um, no international travel, um, no incarceration, um, greater than one day. He said he spent a night in jail. Um, no household birds and no history of gardening. Um, but he works in restaurants and trains as a boxer. 
Um, and he'd been, recently been forced to take time off of work due to lower extremity swelling and shortness of breath, um, which he attributes to his asthma. Thank you, Haley. Uh, Marissa, I'm, my first question is, uh, how do you make the diagnosis of cellulitis? And what do you think of the diagnosis of bilateral cellulitis? Um, I, th I think Haley kind of brought that as our, um, you know, chief concern, because that's, um, it's almost never bilateral lower extremity cellulitis. Uh, that is a it's a common, you know, reason for consult for us. And we're happy to see those patients. Like, absolutely. Um, I think the biggest thing for me when I'm thinking about, I think, um, outside of Durham, cellulitis is often overcalled. And so I feel like I'm, um, I should say, I'm usually telling people it's not cellulitis instead of it is, um, but I think the acuity, right. So that at least in this story, you know, Haley's saying like, this has, happen multiple times, right? You don't usually have cellulitis multiple times. Um, he's already gotten a lot of antibiotics, didn't help. Um, and it sounds like this isn't a, you know, kind of a shorter acute onset. And those things are just, it just kind of raises my spidey senses that this is not cellulitis. And does the uh, label that Haley put as nodular change the way you think about it or what does that invoke in your mind if when she mentioned like nodular oh um i think that opens up so like in dermatology in general we think a lot about morphologies and so i guess for me i like i you know we're so focused on the clinical exam that if the patient says nodules that might mean for me papules or plaques like i, I guess i don't put as much um you know, it's because because Haley's saying it, sure. Um, but I I think I would wait to see myself before I before I call it something. But yeah, nodules doesn't sound as much like cellulitis. Um, but want to see that skin exam? Yeah, of course. <laughs> and uh, can you just remind us what's the difference between uh, plaques and nodules and uh, papules? Sure. Um, so the easiest um, kind of split there is. Papule is less than a centimeter. Plaque is greater than a centimeter. So that's kind of where your mind goes. And those are things like raised up off the skin or more epidermal. Nodules are underneath the skin, right? So like a dermal nodule or subcutaneous nodule, right? They're kind of different layers. Thank you so much. Uh, mm -hmm. Haley, I'm going to throw it back to you for more information. Okay. Um, do we want to go to review of systems next or? Yeah, that sounds great. Okay. Um, so cardiovascular review of systems um, was positive for this intermittent lower extremity edema. Um, he denies any chest pain, palpitations, orthopnea, um, or paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. In terms of respiratory, he has the shortness of breath. He's also had recurrent pneumonias and worsening asthma over the past year. Um, musculoskeletal was positive for um, a heavy sensation in his legs. Um, and then um, skin, he says he has these nodules on his legs. Thank you so much. Uh, Mar Marissa, I was wondering what this also invokes in your brain and uh, are you considering like, oh, could this be heart failure with some venous stasis because of the shortness of breath? I, I'm sure you see a lot of that in, uh, as a consult. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, I think the shortness of breath really kind of catches my ear. Um, and pneumonia, right? Like a young person having pneumonia, right? Like there's some kind of infection in the skin and in the, you know, pulmonary system. Um, I think I'm sure Haley will tell you that kind of what we always think too, is like, is this just the skin or do we need to be thinking about other sub or systems is kind of a big, um, split for us. And so this seems like 
skin involvement, but a systemic disease, just, just the way that it's getting set up. Would you like some uh, past medical history? Oh, I'd love that, Haley. Okay. Um, so he has a history of May Thurner syndrome, um, which I didn't know about until this, uh, but it's iliac vein compression syndrome. Um, and he's had um, recurrent left lower extremity DVTs as a complication of this. Um, he's also had history of pulmonary embolism, um, allergies, asthma, eczema, and the recurrent pneumonia four times within the past year. That's a lot. Sorry, am I allowed to ask questions now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah if you have any questions please go ahead yeah no Haley I just so I'm curious um I guess two things one anybody has a reason why he's had four pneumonias in the last year like for a supposedly otherwise kind of healthy guy in early 20s you said he, he trains a boxer like he's pretty active that just doesn't compute for me yeah, so unfortunately he had kind of been seen in multiple EDs and hadn't really gotten adequate follow-up after these. Um, and so hadn't really been worked up further. And he also, I believe, had moved from Florida to Georgia within the past, or within the couple months um, prior to this. Gotcha, okay. And then the... Um it sounds like it, multiple DVTs were these like provoked, unprovoked, any like hypercoagulable states in the family. Has he taken any, um, you know, blood thinner for that? That's also, that also is like, wow. Yeah. I think it was, um, secondary to his May Thurner, um, with the iliac vein compression. Got it. Okay. And then, um, I don't believe he was on a Pixaban at the time, but had been on in the past. Okay. That's very helpful, uh, Haley. Uh, I think we can go to like exam and see the the initial uh, image that you had. Yeah, um, if we could show that image. Yeah, it'll be just a a sec. Oh, there it is. Okay. Uh. Perfect. So it's really kind of challenging to. Um, to see the skin findings. And when I first came in, I was like, this does not look like cellulitis. Um, but if you can look closely kind of at the left lateral leg, um, most like over the gastroc area, um, there's a kind of hyperpigmented firm um, nodule um, underneath the skin. Um, and there's some smaller, um, smaller hyperpigmented nodules um, kind of lower along the, um, the lateral medial list kind of down more distal. Um, and those were more notable by palpation than they were um, kind of by sight. Um, and then as you can see, that left leg is significantly larger than the right leg. Thank yeah, you so much, Haley. <laughs> Yeah, when I saw the rash initially, I uh, I wasn't sure if I'm supposed to see something or like I was like, oh, where is the rash? I think now that you explained that it's more subcutaneous is uh, is helpful. Uh, Marissa, uh, what what do you think in, in just initial thoughts when you see this? And uh, any uh, advice to uh, people uh, presenting uh, physical exam findings that are dermatologic and like a general approach to presenting those findings? Yeah, I think, um, so dermatologists, right, we're very hands-on. And I think what Haley is trying to say is maybe the pictures don't always do it justice or your eyes, but you're feeling, right? So put on a glove or not, but but feel those areas are really good, right? Are they indurated? Are they subcutaneous? Are they dermal? Those are kind of like little splits in our mind. Um, and I think to kind of your earlier point, these don't look like papules or plaques, right? Like this is something kind of going on, um, deeper in the skin. Um, I do think just because of kind of this, this patient is more Fitzpatrick skin type five, six, um, we should just like kind of, um, so like, uh, 
erythema in skin of color can be a little bit more violaceous, maybe leave a lot of kind of dispigmentation behind. And so I would just have great lighting in this room. Um, and right, like the erythema you see might be more subtle, but it, it could definitely be there. It's it's harder the smaller the pictures get. <laughs> um, but I, I would just, uh, I would not brush off the skin exam, which it sounds like obviously Haley didn't, but, um, you know, feeling it and just being really like good lighting, I think could help you a lot. I will say, um, I didn't see any erythema kind of even in person. Okay. And then I also didn't feel any warmth. Great. Haley, we're excited to know more. <laughs> Great. Okay. So um, would you like me to kind of hop into like our initial lab testing? Um, where, where would you like me to start? Yeah, we can do initial labs. All right. So when we had been consulted um, in the CDU, um, they had gotten like initial CBC and CMP. And so notable from that were, was his white count was elevated to 17. Um, and his peripheral eosinophilia was 63% with an absolute eosinophil count of 10.3 times 10 to the third uh, microliter with the reference range being zero to 0 0.5 times 10 to the third microliter. His CRP was also elevated to 23.4. Thank you so much. Uh, the eosinophil count definitely catches our eye as like internists. Uh, and we have like a list of differentials for that. And in your world, uh, what diagnosis does that bring up for you? And uh, what do you think of immediately when you see this high of an eosinophil count? Uh, I mean, I know there's more and right, like definitely as asthma is coming into it, but we think like bugs and drugs, those are like the first two easy things for that. I mean, I don't know if I've ever seen an eosinophil account that high, so that's impressive, right? It makes me, ooh, that's a lot more than those things, but um, yeah, bugs and drugs, at least for the skin. <laughs> yeah. And Haley, what would you ask? Add to that and what was your team thinking at this time when when you saw these labs along with the rash uh yeah so we had a pretty broad differential at this point um thinking about like eosinophilic cellulitis um chronic eosinophilic leukemia or other like hematologic malignancies um we also had a rare syndrome hyper eosinophilic syndrome such as nodules eosinophilia rheumatism dermatitis and swelling the acronym for this is nerds so we really enjoyed putting that on our differential um eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangitis infectious etiologies we really were thinking about like parasitic infections Haley did you guys I think less so with the eosinophil count but just with the skin exam did you think like erythema nodosum, right? Like easy stuff being easy. Yes, I think we we thought about that. Um, and we did get a skin biopsy to kind of see sure. um, if there was any <laughs> paniculitis on, on biopsy for sure. Uh, as you mentioned in the beginning of the session, it's just, just nerds. <laughs> it's a very, very good acronym. Um, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Okay. Uh, what is the next uh, slide for you, Haley? Is it the scans and the imaging? Yeah, yeah. So we can kind of jump into to all of that now. Um, so because of his unilateral lower extremity swelling, um, a CTPE was obtained um, and a shortness of breath. Um, and if we want to show that, we, I think you have it to add. Um, I can read you the um the impression um there were scattered peribronchovascular and peripheral consolidative ground glass opacities um non-specific could reflect reflect infectious inflammatory etiologies such as pneumonitis or pneumonia 
in the setting of eosinophilia, differential also includes eosinophilic pneumonia um, versus eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis. Um, then there were subcrinal and bilater bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy. Um, and then they didn't see any pulmonary embolism. Um, they did see some smooth uh, bronchial wall thickening and mucoid impaction with mosaic attenuation suggestive of asthma. And I will say proudly, we did also listen to his lungs and he did have end expiratory wheezing. Um, so as a dermatologist, had my, my uh, stethoscope, very exciting. Okay. And uh, Marissa, I'm going to throw it to you. Uh, and at this point in time, uh, what would be your next uh, approach to this? Would you want the tissue initially and uh, while the other workup is pending? Oh, absolutely. This is not like a defer the biopsy kind of patient. You'd absolutely go for the money. So that's that's easy. We do a, a punch biopsy kind of wherever that Haley was saying there was like some indurated areas, go for the good stuff. Um, whenever I'm, you know, going to offer a patient skin biopsy or suggest it, I always, because our, our default is to send for H&E or like regular histopath. And I always kind of run through my mind, like, Hey, do I need to send this for cultures or Hey, do I need to also send this for direct immunofluorescence for this case? You know, I, I guess since I had enough like parasitic kind of weird, funky stuff, you could send for cultures. I think bacterial isn't needed. Like that just doesn't fit. Um, and I don't think you need a DIF. So if he had like blisters plus eosinophilia, we could be thinking like BP or I'm sorry, bulls pemphigoid or something, but I think that's less likely. So I, I think I'd definitely do a, you know, skin biopsy for H and E could consider some cultures for atypical stuff, you know, fungal, mycobacterial, but um, those will take a while to result. Um, but yeah, I think got to go for the money. Yeah. And Haley, uh, any, anything else you would add? Like, what was your team thinking? What were you thinking at this point? Yeah. So we actually did like a pretty extensive, um, laboratory workup because we just, um, we had kind of put into the categories, like, is this malignancy? Is this, um, infectious, uh, like kind of, is this autoimmune? Like what category are we follow falling into? Um, and so I can kind of go through our, uh, our more specialty specific workup. Um, and so in terms of infectious workup, it was entirely negative. And, um, when I say that we got HIV, syphilis, hepatitis, histoplasma, cryptococcus, toxicara, coccidioides, tuberculosis, strongyloides, campylobacter, and stool OMP, just because the eosinophils were weird and we just didn't, didn't want to miss anything. And then we also started a rheumatologic workup um, and we got ANCAs, which were negative, and then rheumatoid factor, which was also negative. Um, because of the concern for like a um, hematologic eosinophilic malignancy, um, we got an SPEP and a peripheral smear. Um, SPEP was normal. The peripheral smear showed eosinophilia as they expected. Um, and then we also got a nephro more of a nephrology workup, which didn't show any proteinuria, hematuria, and it showed a normal urine protein creatinine ratio. So it sounds like all the workup was negative, essentially, and the team was waiting for the pathology or the tissue to clinch the diagnosis. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, um, pretty much. Okay, well, we can't, can't wait to see the slides. Yeah, yeah. Uh... Should we hop to the to the skin biopsy then? All yeah, right. Just, while you guys are doing that, I just wanted to applaud Haley for that like really broad infectious workup because this is like sniffing like we're gonna have to immunosuppress this patient. And so really being thorough um, to rule out infection because right, that's what we could really make worse. I, th I think was really crucial to this. I'm I'm bummed that we're not getting any more, any more clues though, right? Like 
negative mm-hmm. anchors, you know, no <laughs> proteinuria, right? Like we wanted something good. So bummer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and I will note that we did a like telescoping biopsy for this just to make sure we got deep enough um, that we got the information that we wanted. And so we did like one six millimeter punch, took that out at the subcutis. And then we went a little bit deeper in the subcutis just to, to try and get any information that we could. And so, um, and so looking for vessels, because I think that's usually. Yeah. 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 So okay. we, we were looking for vessels. Yeah. Yeah. Cause, um, Cause we wanted to make sure we didn't miss the vasculitis. Yeah. And right. Like when Haley and I are choosing like a skin biopsy site, you, you can't aim for a vessel. So you just try to get as big, as big of a sample as you can and um, hope you give your derm path something, but you know, we're covered in skin head to toe and you're only sampling a small place. So I agree with telescoping. That was a great idea. And then I will also mention we did a lesional biopsy because in dermatology, we kind of consider um, perilesional for something like bolus pentagoid because we want to get some of that intact skin. But um, since since vasculitis was on our differential, um, we wanted to kind of go into the lesion. And because if we're worried about infectious, we want to make sure that we capture the, the bug. Um, and so um, here you can see a, um, on the first one on the right, you can see a moderate predominantly eosinophilic perivascular infiltrate. Um, I'm not sure if it's zoomed enough that people can kind of see those uh, nice uh, bright red cells in there. Um, and then if we go to the, um, the second half slide, um, you can see the small vessel eosinophilic vasculitis um, affecting the superficial dermal vascular channels. Um, and you can kind of see that kind of pink um, fibrinoid necrosis in there um, with some extravasation of red blood cells, um, indicating that there's a, um, a vasculitis occurring. And then it's really, really surrounded by these like slightly darker, but still pink cells that represent those eosinophils. And we went over this with our derm path um, together. And he was like, I've never seen this many eosinophils on the slide. Yeah. And Marissa, is there anything you would add that you can see on the slide or is there anything else here that Haley didn't mention already? Well, mostly just, just to orient like the non, because, uh, right. Like, so as part of dermatology training, we have to do a good, a good amount of derm path. Um, and so, right? Like we're not in the epidermis, right? Like Haley's cropped out, you know, except for that little bit of kind of, you know, tightly knit keratinocytes on the top right of the, you know, right most, right? Like we're, we're in the dermis, right? And so that when we think about matching kind of our derm path to our morphologies, right? That fits with what we were seeing. These weren't papules plaques. They were kind of dermal and even kind of lower. Um, and like Haley said, so the middle of that, um, I'll call it like purplish blob, that little pink blob is a, is a vessel, right? And so Haley got the money shot, which is awesome. Cause you always want, want to look for evidence of vasculitis. And I think it, it is odd to me. Um, I'm not a dermatopathologist, but, um, that many EOs plus vasculitis is, is pretty specific. Wow. In a good way. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, Haley, back to you. What did you all do next? Sorry, I think you're on mute. Oh, my bad. Um, so we had uh, palm involved. We had room involved. We had team involved. Um, and so we kind of took a step back and we we discussed with them directly um, what our concerns were and then um, what they felt like what the pulmonologist felt about these brown glass opacities um, and how kind of this um, hyalur lymphadenopathy. Um, and we were able to make a diagnosis from there. Um, and I think we have the, the criteria if we want to, if we want to go there. Um, I, I think you can go ahead because uh, we just said it's like the highest specificity for vasculitis. So I think feel free to share what you thought and what your team thought. 
Yeah, yeah. So um, we we all kind of agreed that this was eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis, formerly known as Churg Strauss. Um, the having the finding of the eosinophilic vasculitis um, really helped us kind of secure the diagnosis. Um, but there is a um, American College of Rheumatology classification criteria for eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis. Um, and um, we can kind of go through that if you want um, to kind of show how we, we solidify the diagnosis. Yeah, please, we'd love to learn from you. Okay. Um, so for, for this classification criteria to work, um, you have to have um, evidence as a biopsy supported vasculitis. Um, and so we had met that with, with the skin biopsy. And then you have points for different clinical criteria. Um, obstructive airway disease gives you three points. Nasal polyps gives you three points. And mononeuritis multiplex gives you a point. Um, and as we mentioned earlier, this guy had this worsening asthma that had, had become significantly worse as an adult. Um, and that should be like a key, like kind of a light bulb thing for, for eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis, um, because it's not typical that, um, asthma will acutely worsen as an adult. Um, and then in terms of laboratory and biopsy criteria, if you have, a high blood eosinophilia count, um, then that gives you five points. Um, and then extravascular eosinophilic predominant inflammation on biopsy gives you two points. So we had both of those. Um, of note, his ANCAs were negative. Um, and you can get, um, so if you had ANCAs that um, did not support um, uh, eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis, um, which is the C ANCAs or cytoplasmic anti-neutrophil cytoplasmic antibodies, you get minus three points. You didn't have any, um, any positive ANCAs and ANCAs are only positive in about 40% of these, these cases. So at first we were like, oh, the ANCAs are negative. Maybe we're, we're kind of hunting down the wrong hole, but, um, um, but don't let that deter you because they, they don't have to be positive. Um, and then, Hematuria, um, if you have hematuria, then um, you also lose a point. So he didn't have any hematuria. So he ended up having um, a total score of 10. Um, and I believe you need a score of six or more. And this is 85% uh, sensitive and 99% specific. And so we had a score of 10, which was almost double the, the criteria needed. Um, and so we, we were able to make the diagnosis using this very useful uh, criteria guidelines by the American College of Rheumatology. Wow, what an amazing case, Haley. I'm really impressed that you all got it just through the tissue and uh, you all got the diagnosis. Do you uh, know the most common skin manifestations of eGPA? And if not, it's okay. So typically, um, it's more of a small to medium vessel vasculitis. Um, and Marissa can correct me if I if I say anything wrong. Um, and so we can typically see palpable purpura um, with vasculitis because you have um, kind of ischemia beyond the areas of the vasculitic inflammation. Um, but you really can have a lot of different um, presentations in eGPA, um, such as uh, the purpura, eschar formation, um, you can have ichthyotic changes, hemorrhagic bullae, um, pink tender palmar nodules have been seen, um, petechiae, levito reticularis, and urticaria have all been seen. Um, so if you don't see that typical uh, palpable purpura of vasculitis, then I think my biggest thing, that was my biggest takeaway from this. Like you can't just, just look for like the typical vasculitis findings. Yeah, I, I love this case because it's pan negative. Marissa, I'm going to throw it to you. Any reflections, thoughts, and any teaching points you would want trainees to take away from this? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think Haley hit it on the head. I think when I see or feel, right, like indurated nodules, I'm not always thinking vasculitis, uh, but you should be, right? Like that's absolutely, it's 
right? Like we're seeing a lot more um, leukocytoclastic vasculitis or LCV or um, you know, Sean line purpura, IgA vasculite, you know, so like that's where we go to when we think vasculitis, but she's totally right. If you see nodules that can be vasculitis too. And there's, um, yeah, I think that's a great case. Absolutely. Well, thank you both for uh, the amazing case and the amazing teaching. It's uh, always happy to learn more about derm and uh, love to see your passion for medicine and dermatology. Uh, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, and I hope you have a wonderful Monday. Thank you so much for having us, Yusuf. This was so much fun. Um, enjoy nerding out with you. <laughs> Yeah. Thanks team. This was awesome. Really appreciate everyone's comments and just inviting Haley and I. So this is great. Really appreciate it. Thank you.